Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the key ingredients to successful fundraising in 2022 webinar. My name is Ashley Gatewood, and I am the Communications and Marketing Director at CFRI International. So for today's webinar, we have three fundraising professionals from across the UK that are going to share with you their insights and thoughts about fundraising for next year, which I'm sure you know none of us thought we would be going into a third pandemic year, um, but here we are on the cusp of it. We have a question pane. We really wanna make sure that we get your questions answered during today's webinar. So in that question pane, feel free to type in your questions. For the presenters, we will have a Q&A at the end and be aware that we will treat all of your questions as anonymous. We're also recording today's webinar and you will be emailed a link to the webinar if within 24 hours. If you don't see it, check your spam folder first. And then if you still don't see it, you can email share. And I always have to say S-H-A-R-E, not share like the singer share at cfree.org and I will make sure that you get the presentation. So with that, today we are jointly presenting this webinar, CFRI International, with the Association of Fundraising Consultants in the UK. CFRI International is the organization that administers the Certified Fundraising Executive Certification, and maybe you've heard of it. We are the only accredited globally recognized certification for fundraising professionals. And you can find out more at our website, cfre.org. And now Caroline Hutt, who is a presenter today, but also the chair of the Association of Fundraising Consultants is going to uh, speak for a moment about their work. Yes, the AFC is an organization of 15 members made up of um, consultancies and consultants. Um, and our objective is to drive best practice and promote best fundraising practice with our clients. We also support our members with um, online meetings, training and conferences, um, which is very exciting. To find out more, um, our website is afc.org.uk. All right, excellent. Thank you, Caroline. And I'm very pleased to introduce our first presenter today, James Cliffin. So James is the head of fundraising at Médecins Sans Frontières, also known as Doctors Without Borders. And he had helped launch for Médecins Sans Frontières, fundraising in India, South Africa, and Ireland. Previously, James coordinated appeals by the Disasters Emergency Committee and the British Red Cross, and he is a trustee of music support. So James will be talking to us about evolving fundraising using marker pens and sticky notes, which sounds very interesting. So James, I will turn it over to you and we will get started. Thank you so much, Ashley. Um, so um, good morning, good afternoon, and um, Possibly good evening. Um, so yes, I'm. My name is James. I'm the head of fundraising of of, of Médecins Sans Frontières, our original French name. Doctors Without Borders, our English name, and you can translate it into the languages of the world, and that will be our name. Um, before I, I, I go into this talk, I just wanted to say, that if you're in the UK, welcome and hello. And if you're in other countries, um, one of the good things, if you want to find a good thing about the pandemic, is that it's become easier to talk to people in other countries because it's the same as talking to someone around the corner. So I'm delighted to be talking with you today about the experiences that we've had um, during, during, during the pandemic. But this really is a story about changes that we've made over a period of time to adapt our fundraising strategy to, to underlying economic and social trends, which then very much accelerated during the pandemic. Um, and we were in a position to be able to adapt to that. Um, and yes, the, the, the basic technology that we used was, was, was um, marker pens and sticky notes and flip charts. So um, quite a lot of what I'm gonna describe, hopefully briefly, it was really cheap or no cost. Um, but before I, I, I tell you about that story, I just want to say something about the funds that we raised for the charity that I work for. Um, I'm, I'm going to use the abbreviation MSF from now on um, because it would help. It'll help to explain the challenge that we the challenges that we faced. So, um, so uh, MSF, uh, the core of our work, 
um, the origins of our work is providing medical care in conflicts, in wars. And this photograph was taken in August of this year in the newly opened uh, trauma center in Kunduz in Afghanistan. Our hospital had previously been destroyed by airstrikes um, and over a period of three years, we, we built a new trauma center. Um, um, and we were already working in, in Kunduz. Um, and we were able to carry on providing medical care throughout the fighting um, around Kunduz and are still there and are still providing medical services to, to as we are in other locations in Afghanistan and other countries which have been affected by conflict. To do that work, we need to make sure that the money that pays for our work is not seen to be linked to any party that's involved in conflicts. Um, and for that reason, um, almost all of our funds uh, globally are private. There's a very, very small, tiny percentage that, that's from, from governments. And in the US and in the EU and the UK, we, we don't take government funding because to do so would compromise um, the safe access uh, to the medical services that communities that are affected by, by conflict need. If we're seen to be involved in one side or the other because, because of links to money, then it becomes too dangerous for the people that we're trying to help and the medical staff that, that are helping those people. Uh, next slide, please. Um, it's also, we need funds that basically allow us to, to, to scale up very rapidly to, and to do things that are new medically because funding policies of governments don't, 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 the funding from governments doesn't tend to be very rapid and it doesn't tend to be very good at dealing with medical innovation. So these two photographs were taken in um, on the left, at least my view, in Brazil and on the right in India. These were COVID-19 treatment centers that MSF set up during the peak of the pandemic in those countries. Um, that ability to scale up and to act very rapidly depends on the flexibility and freedom that private funding provides. Um, and I could provide many, many other medical examples in our history of HIV, AIDS, of malaria, of sleeping sickness, of tuberculosis, the list goes on. Um, also the ability to act very qu qu quickly when there are natural disasters, private funding provides that, 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 that flexibility, that freedom. Next slide, please. And to speak out on behalf of the people that we're helping, if we are reliant on governments that, that we see as being responsible for the problems of those people, it's, it's gonna compromise the ability to speak out. So this is an example taken from our MSFC Twitter account, which is talking about the work of our geobearance uh, ship in the Mediterranean. And we're speaking out on behalf of the people who are drowning unnecessarily, uh, trying to flee Libya. Um, and again, private funding gives us that freedom to speak out. Uh, next slide, please. So in summary, the funds that we that we raised, we need them to be independent of any any political, religious, user, gender, or other interests. Um, unrestricted, available to be used when, where and when needed, um, and secure, uh, available to be used when needed. So so that's the summary. So that's why we in the country where I raise funds, we're entirely privately funded. And what that means in practice is that the return on investment that we have from private funding needs to be much higher than it is for similar aid organisations. Uh, you know, much higher, which, which, and we're using the same tools that, that those other organizations are using. So it's, it's a major, major, major challenge to, because otherwise we just ended up funding ourselves, no money would go to our medical work. Next slide, please. So how do we do that? Well, actually, in a way, this goes back to the origins of, of MSF, which are French. Um, and a French word, témoignage, bearing witness. Um, it's one of the values of the organization the nurse, doctor, or logistician that goes to, that works with MSF um, has a responsibility to, to speak about their experiences, to bear witness. And that's how we raise funds. So I've got an example here um, on the left-hand side, it's a SoundCloud audio file um, recorded by a doctor called Natalie Roberts. She was in Yemen and she'd worked previously in Syria where she'd seen journalists, but she arrived in Yemen and couldn't see any journalists. So she decided on her iPhone to record testimonies about what she was seeing. Um, and this was at a time when, when hospitals and clinics were being targeted by airstrikes, um, very difficult, stressful work in the midst of the conflict. Um, and we were able to take that testimony and, and have it broadcast on, on BBC radio in the UK. Um, but we also 
turned it into a fundraising campaign for Yemen very successfully. And essentially that's what we do in the, in the different channels we have for fundraising is to bring that to life. When we carry out face-to-face uh, -face fundraising in music festivals uh, every year, we, we bring into the team doctors and nurses like Natalie to, to work alongside the fundraisers to, to tell their stories. That's what we do. And it is very successful. And it has, I've started fundraising or uh, part of the team started fundraising for MSF in the UK 25 years ago. And for a long period, this is very successful, but then it started to fall apart. Next slide, please. And I'm summarizing a very long story into a very few minutes, so I, I'm doing my best to get through this as quickly as I can. Um, but essentially, we ran into a change in the behavior of, of people. And this actually goes back a long time, long before COVID. So right back, actually, for us to about 2004 five, where we started to see a drop off in the measured results from people filling out forms with a pen like this one and, and a rise in people giving online. And in a way, you could say that looks like that, that could be free money, but it, it very much created something of the measurement problem. And this change in, in, in behavior is absolute. You know, I have my phone here and we live our lives on these things, don't we? Um, so if you're doing direct response TV in, in my country, we have the phenomenon of the second screen. You, you know, you, you, you're not going to call the telephone number that's on the screen. You're going to um, you're going to go online on your phone and when you do you're not going to use that url that the the the, the, the charity gives you you're just going to put the name of the charity and then go direct in and we can't measure your result now strategically this this is a very 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 serious issue almost existential crisis because one of the problems that we faced in our fundraising in in my country is that that, that if we carried on trying to push people towards filling out bits of paper and calling a telephone number we were effectively destroying money because that's not how people do things anymore. They don't write a check. They don't call in a telephone number, they go online. Um, so how do we deal with that? Well, we, we work with actually a consultant, not a fundraising consultant called Bob Evanson. We went into a room with our, and this is critical, and this is the core of the story, with our communications, with our digital team, um, and our fundraisers together in one room with some flip charts and we started to create incremental ways of addressing this this crisis of measurement and this crisis of strategy um, and it wasn't an overnight revolution it took time um, an interesting part of it from my point of view is that bob our consultant said when we started this journey in these workshops he said the only person that's not allowed to contribute ideas is me and i'm the if you like the director of fundraising so it had to be from the team and it was very much not about the silos that, that you might find in an organization but everybody together we are in any case in our charity all in one room anyway and we do work together closely but this was a much tighter form of collaboration and the next iteration of that next slide please was that lee who's the head of our digital team which sits within communications not in fundraising went to some training given by google on their sprint uh, process that they use for for development um, and Lee brought a Google Sprint methodology back to us and said, this is how we're going to do this integrated fundraising. Um, and um, <laughs> interestingly, Google apparently spend a week typically uh, when they're running a sprint. Um, and Lee said that there's no way that we could get people to be in a room for a, for a week. So we, he condensed it down to a day and he has had some advice from Google on how to optimize this. But also what we did, and this was a major, major change, is that we bought the marketing agencies that we do work with into the room as well. So everybody is working together. Some key points about this. One, it's pretty much cheap. I mean, very cheap. Uh, the sprint that you can see here is actually in the office of a corporate supporter that's a, that runs venues commercially. So we didn't pay for the venue. We didn't pay for the lunch. We didn't pay for the coffees. We didn't pay for the biscuits. Uh, two, we own the intellectual property because we're co-creating this and bringing people together what gets created in essentially what is a four-way competition between four competing concepts that are developed one day is ours and then it, it's it's created in a way where everybody owns it and buys into it so that then when you go to the next stage next slide please which is our COVID appeal you see all the different channels and the basic idea is they fit together now i'll be honest with you this example from COVID last year is not perfect in terms of integration because we weren't able to go into a room, we had to do this online and do it in a hurry. 
but nonetheless, the methodology served us well. And what it allowed us to do is to scale up many more channels very rapidly, including innovative new ones, um, in a way which we'd never been able to before. And it was enabled by the sprint process. Next slide, please. And a, and a key, key part of it was that the, the, the digital support for the offline channels worked through in, 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 in very, very careful detail, along with a very comprehensive detailed testing program of digital social marketing as well, everything fitting together. Now, um, I don't know, maybe to this to you sounds really basic, but to us, this is very new. And the, the incredible digital marketing agency that we work with, um, which we appointed a, a, a uh, not, not that long before the, the pandemic, called Crafted. Uh, I think we're now up to 14 UK and international um, marketing awards that, that Crafted have won for this work on, on, on integrated campaigns with us, including, for example, an award in, in, in the US where we were in a category with the Department of Homeland Security, MasterCard and Sony, and, and we won. Now, I'm not winning awards doesn't mean that you raise money, but I think it's interesting that, that we've also picked up interest from people in the commercial sector about what we're doing, because this really does seem to be a bit on the leading edge. And I've summarized a huge amount of technical work in down to a few words, but that those stickers, sticker notes in that competition, those, those, those uh, marker pens, those flip charts collaborating together has been the thing that's, that's enabled us to be successful. So I'm pretty much come to the end. I've just got a couple more slides. Um, so back to measuring success. Um, we, we are still grappling with this. I've got to be very honest with you. We have not found the solution. And I know Lee, who I met, just mentioned as the head of our digital team, has been out there talking to people in the commercial sector, trying to find people who've managed to crack this issue of attribution. There are lots of tools out there. There are lots of ways of working in the problem. Um, he's had some pushback talking to some people who's told, told us because people in the commercial sector are saying, why would you even bother with this? This is not really in your, your domain. Well, it is because it's the reality of our fundraising. Um, and I, I, but so we, we do use like a, a software tools that, that attribute online response to TV spots based on the exact moment the TV spot goes out, the audience. So we use a tool, for example, like called TV Squared. We're about to start working with econometric modeling, which may help to provide an answer. But to be clear, this isn't measurement, this is modeling. When we, when we went started going down this route of modeling and attribution, we discovered very early on that our estimate of results um, in terms of the total response to say an insert campaign, a printed insert in a newspaper magazine was wrong by a factor of between 75 and 150%. In other words, we 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 were greatly underestimating our results, and that that had led us down a path of decreasing investment in fundraising. Since we've had that breakthrough in using the type of modeling you see in this chart, we've increased investment, and our results have gone up. In other words, it works. Um, it's not the whole story. Next slide, please. Because going back to the beginning, when I talked about how our return on investment has to be so much higher because we don't have the government income and yet we're using the same tools, easy to say, very hard to do. So how do we make that work? And the answer is lifetime value. For a long time now, and since, since we started fundraising, we ask our supporters much less frequently for additional gifts compared to our peers. We know this because we benchmarked our results through, for example, Blackboard Target Analytics with UK uh, charities that are similar to us. We ask less frequently, but people give more frequently and critically they give but far longer because of the approach that we take, where we're very much focused on the experience they have of supporting us, and that's paramount above everything. So we work with a consultancy called Think on a, on a mystery shopping um, evaluation of the, the detailed service that we provide supporters alongside about 22, 23 other UK charities since 2014. And in that year long evaluation and performance since 2014, we've been ranked first for the overall experience we provide. And that is absolutely key. And again, that is very much about people coming together in a room and working on the detail and not being in silos. And I think that's critically important. So last slide. So we, we, we've been working on some new plans, uh, new plans in MSF, and we, we started, we've worked with a futurologist called Mark Stevenson, who's an incredible um, person, um, very exciting to work with him. And he, he, he pushes a point that bottom-up diverse collaboration wins. Now, we discovered Mark after we started the approach that I've just shown you. But I think, I'm not sure I like the word bottom, because that implies there's a hierarchy where someone like me 
is more important than people who are doing other roles. I think everybody is equally valuable. But the idea that that you diverse collaboration wins is how we've managed to get we are to, where we are today. And we've managed to greatly increase our income. We've managed to grow uh, the number of our monthly donors. We've managed to succeed in raising raising the funds that MSF needs and to achieve that return on investment. And in the end, it really, really, really has come down to flip charts, marker pens, sticky notes, getting in a room, collaborating, including with the, the agencies we work with. And that's what's yielded the results and is helping, has helped us to crack that strategic challenge that I've just outlined. So thank you for listening and I hope you've enjoyed the talk. Thank you, James. That was excellent. It was a wonderful overview of what you've been doing. And thank you so much for sharing the journey with all of us on the webinar today. I appreciate it. So we will move into our second presenter now, Syra Uppel, and she is the Director of Development and External Relations at Dragon School. With over 20 years experience in education fundraising, including 15 within the University of Oxford, Syra will share her insights of running an independent school development office during a pandemic. Her experience includes running regular giving campaigns, major gifts and capital campaigns. And this is my favorite part, super impressive. Syra was part of the 1 billion pound Oxford thinking campaign, which went on to raise 3 billion pounds. So no small feat there. So welcome Syra, we are excited to have you with us and I will now turn it over to you. Thank you very much. I should say that I had a very small part in the 1.25 um, billion campaign. And just in case you were wondering why they picked 1.25 billion as a target, it's because Cambridge picked 1 billion several years before. So I'd like to say there was a whole strategy behind it, but, but there really wasn't. Um, if you want to go into the next slide, please. I just want to talk a little bit about the Dragon School and who we are, because obviously we're not, we won't be a well-known charity to many of you. Um, we are a prep school in Oxford. We are probably the largest prep school in Oxford, uh, in the UK, sorry. We've got 900 children. It's a boarding school and day school for children from the age of five to 13, and we are across two sites. Um, to give you a bit of um, an insight into who our community is, and by community I mean parents, I mean old dragons, who we call our alum, what is what we call our alumni, and our former parents, we're a high profile school with a really enviable database. Um, it includes people like Hugh Laurie, Emma Watson, Tom Hiddleston, Cressida Dick, Rory Stewart. And then for those of in the in the webinar that do trusts and foundations, we have connections to many of the trusts and foundations through families. So the Wolfsons, the Sainsbury's, Tolkien's. So, so we have a, a, a an impressive demographic in which to fundraise from. But with that impressive um, demographic comes some rather impressive targets as well, I should say. Um, but as a an average, just to give you an idea and how that might compare to your to your own institutions. A regular gift for us is, is on average a, a £30 per month and in terms of what a major gift is we're really looking at six and seven figure gifts is what we, we count as a, as a major gift. Next slide please. Now I had a rather ridiculous um, title for this um, for this webinar. I, I'm afraid I don't take titles very seriously um, and really for me the last 18 months has been chaos and crazy. And it's been hard to focus on, on what the key ingredients are for the successful fundraising next year without really taking a moment to take a deep breath and really just recognize how difficult the last 18 months has been. Not just, um, you know, not just in terms of our own selves, but also with the communities in which we're fundraising from. And, uh, you know, I, I I started to think about the things that we were dealing with, not just the pandemic, but the usual things that we're all dealing with and, and came up with some some kind of uh, analogies, basically. But our deflated rubber ringy, uh, a dinghy in our scenario was a broken database, uh, uh, which we're all used to seeing bad databases. But um, ours, we were just in the middle of fin finishing a migration from one database to another when COVID hit. Um, in terms of surrounded by jellyfish, but for me, I'm using that to describe the many charities that we were competing against in the last 18 months. Charities like Medecins for saint that are actually fighting COVID and were fighting COVID. I can't pretend that the Dragon School had a great platform on which to fundraise from. What we were doing was responding to the effects of COVID, but we certainly weren't, you know, battling against, against you know, the evils that it brought, whether that meant 
you know, working on the vaccine or funding medicine, medical research, you know, we, we are a luxury charity and, and there's no denying that. When I talk about in the middle of the ocean, for us, there's no culture of giving at the school. It was a relatively new fundraising office. We had no established regular giving program. Our prospect list was, you know, a, a, a who's who of who's rich, but nothing more than that. With your hair on fire, that was definitely the pandemic. And we were dealing with a community with emails going out on a on a daily, sometimes weekly basis, literally telling the people that we were fundraising from come and collect your child because they now have to isolate for two weeks or come and collect your child, we're closing down the, the, the year or the class for the next two weeks. So um, we were very much in crisis management as a school and finding our place within that in which to fundraise was, was really difficult um, and having to be sensitive to that at, at, at all times. And then a storm on the horizon. Well, for me, we'd pivoted our, all of our fundraising, both regular giving and major gifts around the vision that our head had for the future of the school. And in December of last year, our head resigned. Um, so suddenly we had to rethink and, and refocus everything. So those were the kind of things that, that, that we were dealing with in the midst of the pandemic anyway, just to give you a brief under, uh, understanding of where we're at. Next slide, please, Ashley. Um, again, just to talk about our community and who we fundraise from, we have a finite database. Um, in, in that we, you know, we fundraise from those that have a connection to the school and we don't really go after anybody that, that isn't. So for us, that's 900 parents or the parents of our 900 children, 10,000 old dragons, our ODs, which is what we call our um, alumni, and then four and a half thousand parents that are our former parents um, on our database that we still engage with, particularly those that have, have made a major gift to the school. Uh, next slide, please. Like most traditional fundraising, um, um, institutions, particularly education, we do it through a, a variety of means, regular giving, major gifts, events, communications, um, the trusts and foundations, again, for those of you that, that um, fundraise from trusts and foundations, our trust and foundation fundraising is predominantly based on those that we have a connection with. So we don't do um, cold applications. In, in some cases, we're invited to apply to the foundations. In others, they are family trusts. Um, but they, we're not looking at a database and finding them to suit, you know, the needs of the school. Again, we're a, we're a, a, a kind of luxury charity in that sense, in that we wouldn't appeal to a lot of trusts and foundations. And so it's when we have that that connection through a family member or a member of our community. Next slide, please. And again, this is just so you can benchmark where where you might be. But these are the kind of things that we're fundraising for. So on an annual basis, we look, we're looking to raise 450,000, which is the cost that um, our annual, our regular bursary campaign co um, costs the school each year. And 15 million is the amount that we need to fundraise in order to endow that 450,000 that we need. And then we have a capital build of 10 million pounds, which is going towards a new music and performing arts center. And um, I think putting that £10 million project into perspective in the middle of COVID, as I'm sure many of you might have had to adjust what you're fundraising for, or rather turn the volume down on some of your projects and turn it up on, on um, projects that were more COVID focused. That's certainly something that we had to do at the Dragon, given the mood of the, the nation at the, at the time. So, so we had to really rethink what we were going to focus on the la over the last 18 months in order to be sensitive to what was going on in the world around us. Next slide, please. That that leads me really on to talking about um, finding our space within the last 18 months within the pandemic. Again, we weren't a charity that was finding, uh, you know, finding cures or really helping those that were really in need at, at the um, at the school. Um, that's not really our demographic. And what we had to do really was, was discover who our audience was and, and be brave. There's no denying that what we do at the school is not vital, but it is still important. And remembering that message and really honing that message and making that message stand out to our audience was really important. Otherwise, we might as well have all just gone home for the past, you know, over the past 18 months. So it was a case of knowing our audience, knowing what we could push for what we could ask for and also what we couldn't ask for and when not to ask those were really really important to us because our audience is um 
close to us. They're literally, you know, in some cases, they're dropping their children off on a, on a daily basis. We weren't really afforded the luxury of ignorance. So we knew when a parent was in hospital with COVID. We knew when a grandparent had died from COVID. We knew when a child was isolating and therefore engaging in remote learning rather than being on site. So, so suddenly sending out generic regular giving appeals suddenly became that much more difficult because we couldn't we couldn't claim the ignorance that we that we once might have done and um, so it was constantly about about being sensitive but still finding our space within that finding our space amongst the other charities finding our space amongst the other many many emails that the school was sending out in that crisis management time um, and still being brave enough to ask for money next slide please so again, it was it was a it was a question of, of of being brave and using our voice, even though there were various different other things, and really believing in, in what we were doing. Um, so many educational establishments set up their COVID appeals and and ran COVID bursary programs. So it really was a question of well, if we're not going to do it now, if we're not going to launch a school wide bursary program now, when would we do it? You know, if we weren't brave enough to do it now, then the, the question would be well, should we be thinking about fundraising for something else, and should we, we you know, change the the projects that we're trying to fundraise for at the school? Like most people, we use so many different platforms. Um, we suddenly became digital experts, but we had the budget to do that. A, because digital is a hell of a lot cheaper and always has been the regular giving, uh, regular mail, um, direct mail, sorry. But also I think as, as many of us probably saw our events dwindled and uh, certainly our in-person events dwindled and all the overheads and costs that we would normally have spent on those freed up some of the budget to do a few, a few more clever things and bring in external design and agencies that we wouldn't necessarily have been able to afford to do before um, and really get our digital our digital messaging on brand and on on, on point um, i talk about cancelling out the noise again th that's the case of 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 not being drawn into what everybody else is doing what all the other charities are doing i don't know how any of you how many of you noticed but you know, as a fundraiser, we tend to be more philanthropic than, than, than most. And my inbox was inundated with so many different charities asking for donations during COVID. And also so many friends and family who'd taken it upon themselves to do to, to do fundraising as well. So I was seeing so many amazing, amazing appeals for things that were really on the front line of COVID. And it was it was really hard to see them and know that we weren't doing something similar because we're not that kind of charity. But again, that's going back to finding out, well, what is important about your message and why is your message you know, still valid, even though it's not necessarily saving lives? And then one of the things that we did was show the impact. We spent so much time on stewardship over the past 18 months, much more so than we've ever done before. Again, in some part to justify what we were doing and justify um, the space that we were taking. Um, but we had some really incredible re results. Um, next slide, please. So we normally would send a stewardship piece once a year. As, as as standard and suddenly we were doing it on a termly basis in various different formats whether that was an email or a video we were handwriting comp slips with newsletters pointing our major donors to specific articles um referring to our bursary program for example and i just shared a, a, a few quotes there basically on a on a, a friday on a friday lunchtime a few months back we sent a stewardship piece to to all of our regular donors um, that was that wasn't in our plan. That wasn't something. It, it wasn't the normal time of year that we do it, um, and we didn't think much of it. We just weren't expecting a response, and we came back and we were absolutely inundated. We were inundated with, with um, responses saying thank you so much. I've shared a few of the basic ones here, but some of them were really poignant and 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 lovely. And I think what was clear throughout the pandemic was communication was so important because at the very beginning, and and it's hard because we've you know we're we're so pragmatic as fundraisers, you know, we roll with the punches and, and we work around the obstacles, but actually trying to remember back to that beginning when people were kind of left bereft and we were all in lockdown and we didn't, we didn't necessarily have people to see or talk to. Remembering to communicate with, with our community about what we're doing and why we're doing it, you know, was a real lifeline to some of them and, and not necessarily our parents, but within our old dragon community, you know, we have people, you know, from age 18 all the way up to in their hundreds. And actually, 
being able to reconnect and re-engage with their with their school was something that they appreciated and being able to reconnect with their former classmates i think so many of us reached out during this time to talk to old friends and, and it was the same for our community as well and they they were delighted to have been been contacted whether it was for sharing you know the impact and and stewardship or whether it was asking for money or inviting them to a webinar we had such an increase in engagement whether that was through the fundraising side attendance of online events whether it was click rates and open rates which we we generally tend to have quite high um click rate and open rates anyway across across from a, when you benchmark across the sector we really saw levels of engagement increase ac across the board um and I'd say that that using a, a, a mix of different methods, like I said, not just email, but still when we were able to send posts and we didn't think it was dangerous, um, was something that we we did as well. And, and the response was was fantastic and the engagement was high. Next slide, please. Um, I've talked I've talked about regular giving and, and kind of shifting the, the messaging away from that capital campaign of, of music and performing arts and, and more towards bursaries but there's no denying i'm i'm a major gift fundraiser and um for any major gift fundraisers in in the audience you know nothing can beat a face-to-face -face meeting um or for me certainly it can and getting to know and engage with your major prospects for me the best way to do that is to get in front of them and suddenly to have one-on-one -on -one prospect meetings via zoom was daunting and um interesting to say to say the least and i've got a, a couple of anecdotes i want to share um we were launching that 10 million pound capital project for music the music and performing arts center via a series of events small head head supper events where you you came and had dinner with 10 15 people of our uh, of our within our high net worth individual pool and suddenly we managed to do one live and then we went into lockdown and we were thick in the emergency of dealing with a school in, in a pandemic and the crisis management. So trying to get time with the head and time with the head in order to do a nice to have fundraising dinner, as opposed to the day to day running of the school was really difficult and trying to find um, our voice and get the attention that we needed uh, during during the pandemic was was difficult and we had to persevere and really hammer home the importance of again the importance of what we were doing even though it wasn't necessarily vital our our major gift fundraising went online our dinners went online we we did zoom our head suppers turned to heads leadership uh, heads briefings and then when he resigned we turned them into leadership brief briefings again we had to draw key um senior leaders from the school to in, engage and involve within within those briefings um and i and i will say that you know as much as zoom is so much easier now and i wouldn't blink at, at, at arranging my prospect meetings by zoom and asking for money via zoom i will say that i asked somebody and and, and was successful in asking somebody for a seven figure gift via zoom within the within well a few months ago actually but i've never met that person and and that goes against every piece of training and every rule book i have ever followed and um you know it, it certainly took me out of my comfort zone and to have a series of zooms with somebody never having met them and suddenly ask them for just over a million pounds was a very curious and strange thing to do in fact i still look back at it and think it was really surreal and as much as I'm a huge proponent of hybrid events in the future and using Zoom and using these digital technologies, for me, I'm, I'm looking forward. In fact, I'm meeting him at a real life dinner on Thursday. Um, I'm very much looking forward to being able to engage with people face to face because I think major gift fundraisers, that's what we do. That's what we do best in order to use our intuition and, and know all the nuance of that relationship. Um, doing it in a two dimensional way is, is not quite the same, um, but there's certainly there's certainly a place moving forward and i know that caroline's going to talk about this but there's certainly a place moving forward for all of that digital side and it's certainly enabled people to engage in a way that they wouldn't have before next slide please and i i just want to end on on, on the key the key ingredients really that we're taking forward based on all the kind of trial and error that we learn over over the last 18 18 months um 
I think in order to, to come to the positive statement of what we've learned and what we're doing moving forward, I think it is important to realise the difficulties that we faced and not pretend that it was all fine and wonderful. Um, there was a, a steep learning curve. You know, we had members of staff furloughed. We had members of staff where we were all working from home whilst trying to homeschool children. We had family members that were, that were ill. We had, um, you know, our community that we fundraised from, we knew that they were ill or their families were ill. So um, I think a, a greater level of sensitivity to everything that was going on around us enabled us to write more effective fundraising material and more um, interesting cases for support that, that resonated more. Um, and I think if anything, the last 18 months was a masterclass in agility. We now plan for things to a degree that we've never planned before. So not only did we have a contingency plan, we have a contingency for the contingency plan. Um, you know, learning to be brave and find your voice and uh, and really spearhead what you're saying and get the attention that you need from those within your institution to really sell what it is, you know, your case, what was vital to us. And and again, find that space and, and, and trust in your instincts and, and know that, you know, what you're trying to tell people your audience want to listen to that they're, they're your audience for a reason um and really have every confidence to to go out there and and still do it in a pandemic there were so many um colleagues that i know of in, in similar institutions that used it as an opportunity to dial down their active asking and use it as an opportunity to tidy their databases or or work more on strategy rather than do any of the face-to-face -face asking or the regular giving asking and for me I'm a fundraiser. I wouldn't exist if I wasn't willing to ask people for money. So I always, I always think that that's that's a bit of a cop out. And um, I'll be honest and say um, that actually, you know, there were there there were times when I would have happily hidden behind COVID and not done another Zoom event, or certainly not asked someone for money via Zoom and just wait that extra few weeks until lockdown ended or wait that extra few weeks until things changed. And actually that was not gonna happen. It lasted longer than we ever thought it would. And it's still lasting. You know, there are still instances at the school when we have to uh, postpone events or, or change things around. Um, and so it's just a case of perseverance and, and, and carrying on. And I'd say, um, going back to that, um, my time at Oxford when, when we were raising 1.25, billion when we surpassed that and it was still going strong we actually finished um i think it was in 2009 just as i left on 3.3 billion and for us we tripled our income in the last year so we had an incredibly successful year and it, despite covid i would say rather than because of covid um and the momentum is still strong if we can triple our income in a year when we have so many different things working against us we are really excited for the future and what we're going to be able to achieve in the year going forward um it's a it's a fantastic environment people are much more open to giving same with the, the tsunami in 2004 there's so many first-time donors that have given to charity in the past in the past few years um and it's now a case of utilizing that and really building on it for the future thank you Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Syra, for your presentation. I definitely learned a thing or two about a thing or two. All good stuff there. And now I am pleased to present you with our third presenter today, Caroline Hutt, who is a CF3 and the Managing Director of Hutt & Co. And Caroline set up Hutt & Co following a long career with a large international fundraising consultancy. She began her fundraising career by working for two prominent national charities in the UK before joining the fundraising consultancy in 1996, where she worked on the South African team. In 1997, she returned to Europe and set up Hutt & Co in 2012. She has been a certified fundraising executive since 2004. So with that, uh, Caroline, I will turn it over to you to present with us a consultant's view of fundraising uh, success in the year ahead. Uh, thank you, Ashley. Yes, um, as Ashley said, um, I run a fundraising consultancy um, here in the UK. Uh, our offices are in Leamington Spa. And um, like everybody else in the world, I think, the last 18 months have been uh, very interesting, to say the least as well as challenging. 
Um, as a fundraising consultant, um, we our main client is actually um, what we call selective state schools in the UK. So what we call grammar schools are our main uh, client uh, base. So um, we actually made a decision at the end of March 2020 that we would bring down the shutters. Um, our clients were really um, in the eye of the storm, as it were, of the, of the pandemic. And the last thing they needed to be hearing from is us, fundraising consultants, and about their capital fundraising campaign, uh, which is our main um, way that we fundraise. It's major gifts, capital campaigning. So very interestingly, we decided to pull down the shutters and uh, wait until everybody was through the main of it. We kept in touch with our clients, obviously, during that time, but um, it was a very, very tricky time, as you can imagine. Um, from about January, I would say, this year, we started to hear from our clients and um, new heads of schools around the country, just to test the water a little. Um, we didn't feel it was the right time for them to be going into a capital campaign or doing feasibility studies. And we, but, we kind of got back into it round about Easter time, round about Mar end of March, April time, where we started to re-engage and move forward. We're now in October, the middle of October, we're busier than we've ever been in our lives. Um, albeit that things have changed enormously within our, with our clients and there are challenges, of course. We heard some of that anyway from Sarah, uh, which I would reiterate, we, we've been seeing around the country. But we're back in now. We're, we're now seeing our clients face to face. Um, we're, we're working with schools face to face, um, albeit with some changes. Uh, and what we're feeling at the moment, though, is we're not out the water yet. Um, so we're going to go ahead with our campaigns, but with changes. Uh, next slide, slide peek, please, Ashley. Um, I think one of the biggest changes we've seen is with the advent of hybrid events and engagement. I think we've all become super, super excellent uh, with Zoom and Teams right now. Um, I don't want to embarrass myself by telling any of you how embarrassing my first Teams and, and um, Zoom meetings were, but I was absolutely hopeless. I'm pretty good now um, working that way. and found it incredibly useful through a time of lockdown with a lot of our clients. Um, it's provided us with a healthy and safe forum in which to communicate with our clients. Um, and that's quite important. We're a smallish team and, you know, we've been touch wood, we've been all been healthy it, despite going in and out of schools. Um, and the most massive thing as well, we're saving um, time traveling. We travel all over the UK, and if anybody knows the UK, well, they'll know the nightmare, which is our motorways and traffic. So that's a whew, sigh of relief from us. Um, we're saving our clients' uh, budgets, and also we've changed our clients' expectations as well. Um, we get char we charge clients for a, a daily rate, and I've always felt compelled to see our clients face to face. So, um, you know, they see the effort we put in and, and they would want to see us face to face. But now it's more reasonable to meet often through uh, in schools. It's often Teams is the uh, platform that we meet on, which has been really fantastic that we were able to engage like that far better than by telephone. Um, and we're able to fight fires quite quickly with that. Um, I've talked here a little bit about overcoming geography um, and increasing our reach and uh, expenditure as well. We had one client really in the early days. It was an um, Israeli charity, but which had a global reach. And we did a feasibility study for them. And we were able to talk to people using Teams that we would never have got to talk to in a feasibility normally. Um, from all over the world, we were talking to people in Hong Kong, we were talking to people in Kenya, South Africa, Canada, the States, Israel, the UK, uh, really efficiently. And we normally do about 50 interviews during the course of a feasibility study. And I think 45 of them were done via Teams. And we were able to give, following those meetings, we were able to give a clear way forward for that particular charity. So that worked quite well. Uh, to be honest with you. But I do think um, in 2022, going forward, um, 
virtual events, I do know other colleagues, uh, other members of the AFC, who've run quite successful um, fundraising events through the whole pandemic online that were quite successful. Um, but I do think we need to look at how we boost engagement and create that sense of ownership um, and belonging that uh, a face-to-face -face events uh, bring us. So it's not more than it's more than just sitting in front of a screen, which we're all doing at the moment. But when we click off, we go back to normal life. So um, going forward, I think there will be a place for hybrid events and meetings, but we have to temper it with what we know works, especially with major, major guests, or what I would call capital fundraising model, and mixing it with that face-to-face. -face. Uh, next slide, please, um, Ashley. So the dam sites, now uh, an anecdote, we had a client just before uh, March 2020, uh, Thank goodness they just uh, finished their campaign. It was a, a school in the south of the country, a, a, a boys' grammar school, and they'd raised their target, few, a big sigh of relief all round. Um, but they wanted to continue to fundraise, and um, they took some of their cultivation events online. What we had done, and how did we'd won the ca campaign, is we'd had receptions for parents and alumni where we brought groups together, we'd give them a fantastic presentation and we'd have a Q&A afterwards. And then we'd ask people just to fill in a response card, interested in giving, interested in volunteering, or it wasn't for them. And at these uh, receptions before COVID, um, we had a fantastic response. Um, vast majority, I'd say 95% of people who attended ticked the box to say that they wanted to give. They were then followed up and, and gave, uh, and get, gave significantly so during covid the school uh, we were no lo they were no longer clients of ours but we still stayed in touch with them they put on these events and um, in fact whilst participation was up the um the the um follow on the money raised from each event was only between 10 and 15% of what they would actually expect and as i explained to them it would be difficult to go back to those audiences uh, now, so these, I would say, these were quite uh, relevant. It would be difficult to build lasting relationships. People are less um, emotionally responsive, and there is less commitment if you're going to have these events online. So that's the danger sign for us. So moving on. Actually, next slide. Sorry, um, I just want to quickly go in because it's not my favourite. I have to be honest. I, I, I. I I don't like social media hugely, I have to say, but we have noticed that during the pandemic that more and more people, not just in fundraising terms, but right across the board, we're getting more familiar with using LinkedIn, Facebook, all the normal, Twitter, I mean, goodness, that was massive, and things like TikTok as well and Instagram. Um, and so when we've now emerging out and we're working now with our clients on campaigns, we're now finding ourselves crafting um, strategies that will suit them. So they're using the best, better platforms that will suit their particular communities. I think that's quite important. We're also teaching them etiquette as well, because, um, you know, even setting up a WhatsApp group, there's certain things they shouldn't be putting on there that um, don't comply with um, data protection policies, etc. So we're now teaching our clients about how to use social media in a fundraising context um, that they weren't before. And I think as fundraising consultants, we have to really stay ahead of the curve on uh, all the new platforms that are coming up. And I, I put some of these on here, you know, Facebook stories, Twitter spaces, um, and the, the ones that are emerging at the moment me, we, Discord, Ubo, and Hong. Very difficult for me to get my head around, but apparently they're the new platforms that are coming on that we need to be aware of. I've got one head at the moment uh, who's they the schools very regularly um, send out monthly new, uh, weekly um, newsletters to their parents, and that's how they communicate, sending out these newsletters um, by parent mail. And um, I've I've got one head now delivering that as a small film. Um, little live stream uh, to parents and that's going down extremely well so it's something to put into the mix going forward uh, next slide please Ashley um so all in all going forward um I think the the things we've learned during lockdown uh, using technology I think you know social media whether it's hybrid events 
um, we have to mix those up a little bit with what we used to do pre pre COVID world and mixing them up now. So using all that um, knowledge that we've got from tech and making sure we apply it rightly um, with our campaigns going forward, but not throwing out what we know fundamentally works, especially with major gifts um, campaigns, uh, which is our speciality. Um, we're, we're looking at the moment um, with during lockdown, of course, um, a lot of people we got used to paying with cashless um, giving, and in fact, cashless giving went up, not surprisingly, during COVID. So it's looking at how we can help our clients move to more te technological ways of giving that that is more efficient um, going forward, but doesn't, but still complies with um, getting the money in, as it were. So moving on to the next slide, please. I just want to tell this really interests me actually because um, I think all of our communities have changed through COVID and not always for the worse. I think some things have really been positive. Um, as we've heard, charitable giving is up, which which just goes to prove that through um, um, wars, pandemics, and tsunamis and everything else that the world throws at us as human beings, the people who help will continue to help. And I think that has been very encouraging as we uh, go forward. And as we're returning to work now, and as the workforce comes back to work, whether that means um, at home as well as in the office, uh, we have to really be mindful of how that um, will um, march out as we go forward. And one thing that we're seeing though, and these are early days with our campaigns now that we've reinvigorated, is that more than even before, we need a stronger case of, for support. The, the fundraising narrative needs to be emotion, uh, emotive. It needs to really show the impact a potential donor will have, their money will have on a particular organisation they're supporting. I think that more than any other time that I've been doing this uh, is more relevant today than ever before. People need to trust what's what will happen to their money and be confident that those campaigns will work. I also think people are reacting to a human story as well. So we're putting in there um, case studies um, into all of our campaigns so people can see for themselves the impact. Um, I would also say that developing um, development strategies, um, master plans, um, we're, we're advising our campaigns, uh, our, our clients now, that they need to have um, the ability to flex, pivot, and, and to adapt quickly. No longer fixed in stone those 10-year development plans, but rather you have um, phasing that can change or you can move the phases as we move along and we need to be able to move at speed. But I think we've shown that we're able to do that through the last 18 months. We're still here. Um, and I think within schools, and I'm seeing it in the school we're working in at the moment, I mean, last time we were in there, they'd had a massive spike in COVID cases. And the um, knock, knock on from that is their staff are, are under strain as well. They've got people who are off sick. Um, they, they're, they're under pressure. They're irritable. And they are, um, and they're, they've invited us as outsiders to come in and start raising money for their capital projects. So we're having to manage um, that at the moment with, with our clients, um, which is proving challenging in some cases. But on the good side is we are finding that we're able to engage, and we engage with the parents and the alumni, with people, the great and the good of the organizations we're working with, who we wouldn't necessarily have be, had access to before. Um, I'm talking about parents um, who would normally be on the 5.30 train, AM train into the city back at 10 p.m. at night, who aren't particularly engaged with their communities because they work, a lot of them are working from home for part of the week at least. They really got engaged with their, their children's schools, their, the organizations within their families, their, their close communities, and they're becoming advocates for those organizations. So picking them up for a capital campaign has been a lot easier than it was before, which is really encouraging. And we're putting to board, uh, together a board at the moment that not only um, have joined, but also are accessible to us. So they're, they're free to come to meetings and they're coming in person, although we spread them out a little bit. Um, but they're all keen and, and they're committed to raising money 
uh, through the next um, academic year, which is very encouraging indeed. Um, so I think that's a positive as we move forward. Moving on to the next slide, um, Ashley. Hi. Yes, Caroline. So we actually, we've got one minute left in the hour. So I'm sorry that we might not get to people's Q&As, but um, Caroline, okay. go ahead and take us away with this slide. Yeah, I'm just saying, I'm, that's just reiterating what I'm saying. I would say on the final slide, Ashley, I'm just going to sum up really quickly. I think it's a very positive way forward in 2022. I think 2020 is when we all froze. 2021 is when we came out of a deep thaw, out of a thaw slowly, but I think 2022, if we learn the lessons of the pandemic and move forward, I think it will be a bumpy year, although with some bumps in the road. I'm finished. <laughs> thank you so much, Caroline, and sorry about the rush towards the end there. I do oh, want to no thank everyone for attending, and just to say, if you have any questions, please send them to share at cfree.org, and I will be sure to get them to the presenter so you can get a response. And we will be sharing the full slide deck as well as a link to the recording to your email. So thank you so much for being with us today, no matter where in the world you are. It was a total pleasure and a very huge thank you to James, Syrah, and Caroline for sharing all of your fabulous knowledge with today's attendees. Take care, be well. Thank you, everyone.